All right, well, maybe I'll just get us started here and I'll pass it over from there. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're very excited to have you this afternoon uh, for our Liberal Learning Entrepreneurialism 4.0 session, the fourth industrial revolution in the College of Innovation and Technology. My name is Nick Custer. I'm program manager through the Office of Economic Development for our EDA University Center for Community and Economic Development, uh, which serves as a resource both to campus and community, providing no-cost business counseling and expert-led discussions and workshops like this today. Um, if you haven't yet heard of us, I'm going to go ahead and put our web address in the chat uh, as we get started here. And again, if you're thinking about starting that business or nonprofit, or if you're already working on your big idea, we want to be here to help guide you through that process. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to one of our great colleagues, Dr. Roy Barnes, the Associate Dean for the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you very much, Nick, and welcome to everybody who's joining us. Um, I, I want to just start off with a couple introductory remarks about the liberal learning and entrepreneurialism uh, series, which is actually in its fourth year. About five years ago, actually, I was touring the what was now what is now the Ferris wheel, and I was talking with David Olilla, and he was saying about entrepreneurialism and what it takes to be an entrepreneur as we're walking around the building in hard hats and, and climbing over, avoiding holes in the, in the concrete. And he was talking about things like risk taking. He was talking about things like um, not being afraid to fail, taking risks, um, learning from failure, learning, um, being able to pivot, being able to change what you're doing um, as circumstances uh, demand. And the more and more he talked about it, I, I, the more and more I thought, man, he's actually talking a lot about what liberal learning is about. Because really liberal learning is about how to problem solve, how to think differently uh, when context changes, um, how to learn from failures, how to reflect on your learning. And so I put the two together a few years, uh, four years ago, and we started this series on liberal learning and entrepreneurialism. And so, given that this is the fourth year that we're doing it, it, are, it also corresponded to what I see as, well, to what is the now known as the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0. And so there was sort of this nice convergence of two things, the fourth year of the liberal learning series, and then this, no, these notions about liberal learning and, um, with about the fourth industrial revolution. So with that sort of brief introduction, uh, we'll get into we'll get into the talk. So I want to thank, deeply thank our provost Sanja Feast Price for joining us and the inaugural dean of the College of Innovation and Te uh, Technology, Chris Pearson, uh, for participating in this talk. And so, with that, I'm going to start off with a question. Uh, with this series with this session being focused on the College of Innovation and Technology, I, I want to begin by just asking both of you, what are your visions for the College of Innovation and Technology? And as, as, the, as the university's first um, academic or newest academic unit. And so Chris, as the Dean of the newest academic unit, let's, let's start off with you. Yeah, thank you, Roy. It's a pleasure to be here today. So, as, you know, as the College of Engineering and Technology is kind of is being built from the ground up, it provides an opportunity that's really unique within higher education. And that is the opportunity to be very creative and very uh, outside the box thinking with novel ideas incorporated throughout the design process. I mean, of course, CIT is being developed to prepare students so that they are the talented in demand workforce of the future. Clearly, they need technical expertise, but that will be developed through experiential hands-on learning. Our industry partners continue to affirm that, that creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, cultural awareness, those aspects that are really cultivated in a liberal arts education are really, really sought after highly in the workplace and, and are needed, actually. Um, and central to the development here is in the infusion of real world experiences, concrete examples that students can point to, project-based learning, strong ties with industry to give industry-driven curriculum and labs, um, 
you know, and just a, a very close tie with uh, with uh, concrete experiences. And so, so the, these strong ties with industry and the clean sheet approach really allows for the reimagining, really, of a, of a, of a regional higher ed, uh, education institution. And maybe, you know, this can be a transformative experience and cement UM Flint uh, as a leader in, in this area. Okay, great. So what I'd like to first off say thank you, uh, Roy, for the invitation. I'd like to thank each and every one of you that have joined us today. I'm delighted that you're here and I hope that you'll take something from this talk that you could take with you throughout the day and uh, with the work that you're doing to impact our campus community. So building on what was communicated by Dean Pearson and CIT as being a tabula rasa, more than ever before, our faculty, our staff and our students must be nimble as we strive to be responsive to the needs of business and industry communities, as well as the demands of society. And as faculty and staff, we must prepare our students both in the classroom and in the community as they engage in experiential and service learning opportunities about the ways in which technology and innovation are advancing the workforce and the communities in which they live. And one of the ways we ensure that we remain knowledgeable is by creating and working with uh, industry advisory boards, where industry partners engage with faculty and help to inform our pedagogy. And so by tracking the practical aspects of education through hands-on approaches and remaining in touch and current in the needs of industry, we can design curriculum, experiential learning, and create internship opportunities where our students can discuss not only theory, but the application of technology. So for our students who are not pursuing degrees in the College of Innovation and Technology, we must also ensure that they too have requisite knowledge about the ways in which technology and innovation are transforming almost every aspect of the world as we know it. So I'll stop there. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Prose. So there's certainly a lot here, um, and I want to get back to some of the specifics about um, new or thinking about our pedagogy differently, the importance of industry advisory boards, and certainly a topic that's near and dear to me is the integration of the liberal arts with the uh, College of Innovation and Technology. But I want to keep these introductory comments um, at a little bit higher level of abstraction as we get, get the talk going. And I want to sort of first um, talk about connecting the points about technological foundations with some of the broader issues or the technological innovations, I'm sorry, with um, some of the broader issues of the prior three industrial revolutions. Uh, this is the fourth industrial revolution, which implies that there's three earlier ones. And so can we talk a little bit about or can you highlight some of the analogies of what you see in the prior industrial revolutions in terms of say the steam engine in the 18th century electricity and computers um, with, what's, with what's going on sort of with the, um, in, in society at the time. And then we'll pivot and talk a little bit more about what are the say differences with the fourth industrial revolutions and what you're seeing in terms of societal impacts and implications for everything from our daily connecting things at our home to um, how we do higher education. So um, I'll leave it with that. So um, Chris, why don't you go again? And we'll see, see, yeah, see, what, see what comes up. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, you know, as Roy mentioned, you know, if this is the fourth, there need to be three uh, three previous ones, right? You know, uh, we started with, with steam power, right? So steam engines gave rise to transcontinental railroads, among other things. But that really dramatically changed transport, transportation and society, right? Mass production, that dramatically changed economic class because it allowed the working individual to afford a car. Computers changed the way we do business and communicate with each other. And that dramatically changed the workplace and how work is done. So now today, some of these 
technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, cloud computing, internet of things, right? These are the technologies that are changing society today. So during the first three industrial revolutions, kind of what was common is that the skills the workers needed to keep ahead of the machines were largely cognitive, right? Machines were doing routine tasks and manual tasks. And the cognitive stuff, the cognitive tasks were the exclusivity of humans. Higher education contributed with engineering emerging as a discipline in response to the needs of mechanization and mass production. And then computer science emerged in response to the increasingly complex algorithms needed, for example, for one example, to land a person on the moon and return them safely to Earth. So, so, so what's unique then about the fourth industrial revolution is that it changes this situation. The proliferation of artificial intelligence and machine learning means that humans no longer are assured of being the cognitive champion. champion. Thinking or non-routine tasks will increasingly be done by machines and machines will be able to process more quickly, more cheaply and with fewer errors than their human counterparts. So as artificial intelligence begins to impact the workforce and automation replaces some existing skills, then some other skills like emotional intelligence, creativity, and critical thinking need to be augmented. So I'll, I'll stop there, pause there for a moment. So what I will add is that, you know, the industrial revolution is not merely an acceleration of economic growth, but it's also an acceleration of growth because of and through economic and social transformation. So social and educational transformation from the first three industrial revolutions give rise to the transformation of the fourth industrial revolution. So with the first industrial revolution, there was a vision of a new kind of a curriculum with a more diverse set of degree options. We also had general education designed to produce a breadth of study through the selection of elective courses. And this was described as the new education, which was a dramatic shift from the dominant classical education with the dawning of the second industrial revolution, we evolved to a more co-educational learning environment, which increased the role of women in academic settings, as well as in industrial settings. We also had a commitment to veterans in higher education through the GI Bill. Community colleges were created in 1947 and also the research mission of universities expanded as a result of federal funding. So with the third industrial revolution, there was a proliferation of new educational institutions and new curriculum. And so universities throughout the country were being developed. Uh, there was access to higher education um, where there was greater prominence, so more access to a college education than ever before. There was an increase in diversity on campus, online technologies resulting in globalization of academic uh, research courses were offered. And if you can recall back to 2012, uh, where there was a lot of discussions about MOOCs, where we had massive online open course offerings, we also had a lot of personal explorations and coaching and mentoring services that were made available. And also during the third industrial revolution, there was a proliferation of more online learning, hybrid online and in-person instruction along with flipped classes. But with the dawning of the fourth industrial revolution, we're seeing more and more about artificial intelligence data analytics, technology offered uh, to deliver education. And we talk a lot about data informed decisions. So we use the data to think about ways in which we can best serve our students in terms of their well-being 
and also student success. But I also want to note that while we recognize the importance of data and analytics to help us to understand how to best, how to best assist our students, we don't want this artificial intelligence to become big brother where we're paying more attention to our students than we should or we ought and we're acting as a big brother to the behavior of our students. So AI or data will never take the place of human relationships, the relationships that we form with each other as well as with our students. So yes, the fourth industrial revolution has brought about a lot of AI and data use and technology, but relationships and having a research and a relationship rich educational environment is still of paramount importance. So thank you. I mean, so Chris, you highlight that humans won't be the cognitive champions anymore or in, in, the, new, in the near future. And Sanjay, you've emphasized the need for a relationship rich, rich education. So beginning with you, Sanjay, how is the, the fourth industrial revolution say qualitatively different? So, I mean, I could ask the question, well, you know, the changes that you both have talked about, well, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna unfold in time, right? Um, you know, I think progress takes, you know, progress takes time. Um, and that the effects of these changes, the effects of the, these innovations and in the new technologies, well, they're gonna be gradual. And, you know, social institutions will have time to adapt and, and including higher education. So with that sort of, a, how would you respond to that sort of, a, that, that sort of response to, to what you've said in terms of what's knocking at the door in terms of the fourth industrial revolution? Yes, so you know, with the fourth industrial revolution, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the ways we live, work and relate to one another its scale, its scope and complexity, the transformation will be unlike any other we have ever seen in our existence. And hearkening back to Chancellor Dutta's uh, presentation, he referenced uh, Claus Schwab uh, who noted, he talked about the velocity, the breadth and depth and mm -hmm. the systems impact of the fourth industrial revolution being like none we've ever seen before. So as it relates to velocity, the speed of the current breakthroughs that we're seeing in this fourth industrial revolution is unprecedented. So with AI and automation and the use of data analytics, it's really changing the world much faster than any other industrial revolution. And it's due to the internet you know, we are more interconnected as a world than we have ever been before. And as it relates to breadth and depth, these technologies are changing our economy, business, society, and people. So if you think about it, entire systems of production, management, and governance are changing as a result of this fourth industrial revolution. Also, there's a systems impact. With the fourth industrial revolution, we're likely to impact entire systems of societies, across societies, at every level of social organization. So if you think about AI and its modern conveniences, it's pervasive. So think about we're, the fact that we're evolving to a place where we're having more and more self-driving cars we have drones, we have virtual assistants, we're able to order cabs via our cell phones, we're booking flights and buying products and making payments, listening to music and watching film and playing games in ways that we have never done before. And you know, the list goes on and on. These are only a few ways in which AI is influencing our lives on a daily basis. And persons who continue to gain the most from the fourth industrial revolution are those who are able to afford and access this digital world. But according to some economists, the fourth industrial revolution 
could yield greater inequality and inequities than we have ever seen before, especially when you think about the ways in which AI is disrupting labor markets. So job market, the job market is increasingly separated into low skill, low pay positions and high skill, high pay positions, which is causing a greater rise in the wealth gap in mm. this country. So I'll stop there. I, yeah, I will follow up by, by you know, reiterating what the, what the provost has just mentioned about you know, the disruption and the speed of the transformation. I mean, this, this fourth industrial revolution is as significant as the previous revolutions, and it's gonna to lead to an entirely new way of working and thinking. Uh, the provost mentioned a few examples, but within higher education, right, we have, higher education has for, for uh, most of its uh, entirety, focused on the development of cognitive skills and not so much on the development of technical or emotional skills. But in the future, graduates, preparing graduates only with cognitive skills will not be sufficient. Future tasks will require creativity and intuition to solve problems whose solutions require great leaps of imagination and novel ways of thinking. And although there will always remain a demand for skills to program and test and oversee machines, the, these social skills and emotional intelligence, the creativity, the critical thinking, rather than the cognitive skills alone, will become increasingly important. Higher education will also need to account for this disruptive evolution. For more than 100 years, the academy has been measuring students through a grading system that rarely encourages risk taking and in fact creates a fear of failure mentality. This is an area that requires a little bit of self-reflection and change. I mean, this does not mean failing just for the sake of failing, but it does mean creating an environment that must be established for, to, to remove the fear of failure and it allows students to focus less on what works and more on creative solutions that may be risky and unproven. Right? Organizations such as Tesla and Netflix have been very successful employing this type of model. Also, you know, the model of four years in school and then a career until retirement, that's changed. The boundary between being in school and being in a career needs to become more permeable without any penalties for crossing over from one to the other. Meeting students where they are at, whether it is an 18 year old FIDIAC student or a 40 year old adult learner, we must continually think about innovative ways to create pathways for all to succeed. Thank you, Chris and Sanja. Um, I, I, I think the response in, in a nutshell to, to my sort of more naive question would have been changes are happening now, they're happening quick, and um, we, better, we better get ourselves prepared. And, and I think, Sandra, you make a really, really important part, point that these have societal impacts. It's not just technological change that's just going to affect manufacturing. This is going to affect every sector of our society and hence every every individual in our society. And so we need not only to think quick and fast, and we need to think carefully and interdisciplinarily because we're, we have social issues to deal with. We've got economic inequality issues to deal with. And you know, as, as, as Chris was saying, you know, we have educational uh, challenges in terms of how do we meet the demand so that we don't lose those people um, that, that are negatively affected by the, by the fourth industrial revolution. Indeed, the, the slide that Chris has here about um, the university class in Bologna in, in 1350. So in some ways things haven't changed for almost 700 years, not just the last, the last 100 years. And, and certainly in my 
in my career as a student, I, I could, I can kind of relate to the guy in the bottom right there, you know, in terms of being in class. But that's, a, that's another story that uh, perhaps we can get to at another time. Um, and, I, and I certainly don't want to lose the, the thread of creativity that both of you have mentioned. But I, I want to shift gears and talk a little bit more nuts and bolts. And it's interesting how those those analogies are actually from the, the second industrial revolution, shifting gears and nuts and bolts, and, and talk about what are some of the technologies that the CIT is positioned to pursue this coming fall? I mean, like, like in three or four months, we're going to be delivering curricula. And so um, in the next slide, there's a cluster of technologies. And so maybe, Chris, you could start off talking about what are, what are some of the things the CIT is going to be doing in the fall? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, Roy. Yeah, coming it down a bit from the from the thirty thousand foot view, right? So, um, for fall, we have two. There are two inaugural programs for fall. Um, one is uh, titled Digital Manufacturing Technology, and the second is titled Information Technology and Informatics. Digital Manufacturing Technology is uh, computer science applied to manufacturing and automation. So, when a student would graduate. Instead of working, say, for Google or Microsoft, those companies that focus more on software development, they may work for the manufacturing arm of uh, General Motors or Ford or Pfizer, right? Um, and these just represent a few of the many companies in Michigan that are increasing their investments in automated manufacturing and manufacturing 4.0 technologies. You know, as long as people use products, there's a need for manufacturing sector. So it isn't going anywhere. It's not all of a sudden just gonna be gone, but it is becoming more and more digital. And the other program, information technology and informatics, you know, that focuses on a broad base of computer related skills and prepares uh, students to become application developers or business analysts. IT consultants or, or network administrators, but you know, just setting aside the job titles for a moment, this program really prepares graduates for employment at the intersection of people and technology. You know, um, future program possibilities, which include uh, biomedical technology, which of course is closely related to uh, precision, precision uh, medicine, right? And energy and sustainability, these really branch into all of the areas, artificial intelligence, machine learning, internet of things, robotics, blockchain, data policy. These are the ones that we'll be concentrating on for these first two inaugural programs, but going forward, right, all of these um, will, will be in our curriculum in the, in the very short future. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah. So, and what I will add is that, you know, for me, I'm less familiar with some, all of these technologies, but the slide does make me think about the ways in which AI, cloud computing, and big data are becoming central to our work with students. And what I know are the capabilities of our new CRM, the customer relationship management software, that we're in the midst of uh, implementing. So having a CRM, a customer relationship management system within our campus community, it allows us to rethink the student experience and it also helps to implement one-stop shops and other services to better serve the needs of our students. And in doing this, it puts the student experience at the forefront of all the work that we do. So when I think about our CRM or our customer relationship management software, it'll be Target X. It improves our recruitment and our retention by targeting engagement based on students' individualized educational goals. And so when you think about the ways in which these uh, AI software, this AI software allows us to look at students not in, a, in an aggregate, but as an individual mm -hmm. and think about their individualized needs. So that's the excitement associated with AI and technology. 
So in addition to improving our recruitment and, to, and retention, it also allows us to track results and outcomes across the student life cycle. So all of this information is allowing us to understand students across the life cycle as it's aggregating our findings across time. And it's also individualized as we're looking at the tracking of results and outcomes. The, another way in which our CRM is benefiting our campus community, and this, is, this technology is, ha, will have a profound impact on the ways in which we assist students is through the engagement with our students across multiple channels. So not only will we be able to establish appointments, but we'll also be able to send text messages and emails to our students to communicate with them on a regular and ongoing basis. We'll also be able to track and maintain relationships with partner organizations that are affiliated with our students. And this might include community-based organizations as well as uh, corporate or employers that are engaged with our students. And the fifth and final way in which our CRM will have a profound impact within our campus community is that it'll allow us to pro promote a genuine sense of community among our students, such that our students will have a sense of belonging and engagement, despite the fact that some of our students are commuter students mm -hmm. or they're attending online. So those are just some of the ways in which we will be using and, and are already using the CRM in order to positively impact, impact the student experience. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, this is really interesting. I mean, in a way, these emergent technologies are, are certainly affecting our curriculum, <clears throat> as, as Chris has noted, in terms of new programs and future programs. <clears throat> but as you, you emphasize, Sanja, the new technologies through the CRM is enhancing our abilities to connect with our students and, and, and foster that, that relationship rich um, educational experience that, we, that is really so important. And certainly the literature has shown how it's important for, for retention. So I, I guess I'd like to keep on this theme of our students, a very important central theme, um, and think a little bit about what, does the, what do these new technologies mean for their careers? Right. Uh, we talked about their experience and we talked about some of the challenges, but what what do these um, these emerging technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, how can we help them prepare for the, the life ahead of them in terms of their careers and the labor market, which I would have to imagine if I were in their shoes seems a little a little uncertain right now. Absolutely. And I, I have a slide that I believe. Um, sums things up best in terms of what um, the skills that are being sought by companies. And uh, so I ran across this interesting graph on what skills companies will be requiring in the next couple of years. And I'll just highlight some of them. Um, so about 85% of companies will be requiring skills in big data analytics, 85%. 72 to 75% of companies are looking for skills related to app and web enabled markets, machine learning and, cl and cloud computing. Additionally, about 58 to 59% of companies will be requiring skills in digital trade and augmented and virtual reality. So I won't go through the entire list, but one of the things that I think is compelling about this slide is that it allows us to see that companies are seeking highly skilled individuals related to technology. And I ran across an interesting report by the McKinsey Consulting Group that reflected that about 50% of all the activities done at work could potentially be automated with current levels of technology. Think about it, 50% of all of our activities at work can potentially be automated with our existing technology. 
And this trend will accelerate exponentially. Another fact that was really, really interesting to me was that currently an average of 71% of our total task hours across industries are performed by humans, 71%, compared to 29% by machines and algorithms. But by the year 2022, mm. this average is expected to have shifted to 58% of task hours performed by humans and 42% by machines and algorithms. So from 29% machine and algorithms to 42% by next year. So there are some jobs where human traits that are expected to grow, those jobs that require certain, certain traits, there are some that will grow over the next few years. And just to name a few, and I'll share more a little bit later, they are customer service workers, sales and marketing professionals, and training and development professionals. So what that says to us is that while there are things machines can do and do well, there are also, there are also those professions that still requires the human touch. And so more will be uh, shared a little bit later about some of those jobs as well. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll follow up with the, you know, the provost gave some eye-opening statistics there. And, you know, I, I will follow up by saying, you know, not just for our students, but for everyone. And I'm going to put myself into that category. Being more conversant in technologies will just, will be required and important going forward, especially with how rapidly technology is influencing society in this fourth industrial revolution. I mean, regardless of discipline or what college or school a student attends, being conversant and reflecting upon technologies is needed. You know, what is machine learning, for example? I mean, I'm not really asking about, you know, what are the algorithms behind machine mm -hmm. learning, but how will it impact the work that you do in the future? And who is responsible for a decision made through a machine learning that adversely affects a sector of society. I mean, these are the types of rich discussions that we can have across all disciplines. Because, and, and it's important to understand this is a two-way conversation, right? Because it's important for the people making the algorithms to understand the possibilities of what can happen. But it's also important for those that are making the policies to understand that, see, at, at least to some level of understanding how the algorithms are put in and what inputs uh, drive the decisions. So I, you know, I think that's a great discussion that we have to have across all disciplines and, and get all backgrounds uh, uh, working together. Absolutely. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the, the statistic you cited, Sandra, about the amount of work being done by humans versus algorithms and machines shifting from clearly the lion's share, almost three quarters to a little bit over half is in, you know, just by next year is pretty shocking, um, let alone eye-opening. <laughs> and I would, I would say though, I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna throw this in just, I mean, in some ways, this is also an opportunity for us, right? Because if yes. in a way something, what you were saying was almost like in, in terms of my own experiences and some of the things that I do, you know, it gives me time for more thinking and less work on number crunching, right? If, if we could get some of this stuff automated, I can think about things like, how are we preparing our universities for the 21st century and the students in the fourth industrial revolution versus how to connect one spreadsheet with another spreadsheet with VLOOKUPs and all this other kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that there are some real possibilities to enhance what we do and not necessarily necessarily replace what we do, right? But that's going to take conscious effort on the part of higher educational institutions to prepare, as you were saying, Sandra, at the beginning, to prepare our students for that transformation, because if they're not, they're going to, they're going to be left behind. So with that in mind, I want to sort of think a little bit about the in-demand skills that are coming up. And so uh, if you could talk a little bit 
uh, we'll start with Chris maybe and talk a little bit about the next the next graph here, which talks about the in a way it talks about the changing demand of skills that Sanja sort of uh, prefaced in in her comments. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Bright. Yeah, you know, and uh, for for people have used the the uh, um, the description of a T shaped professional for for a long time, right? And that's a renaissance people who combine this technical expertise with breadth of knowledge. And that was exemplified by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, you know, in our academic setting, the stem of the letter T represents the technical expertise, you know, regardless of discipline again. And, and the bar of the T represents these 21st century skills that industry continues to affirm are vital for their employees. And the reason, you know, they want the best employees because they want obviously their their business to be successful on some of their you know to their uh, to their benefit, um, and in all the conversations that I've had um, with industry partners, you know they affirm that they need employees with skills in the in the creative problem solving that's on this chart, the critical thinking, the collaboration and cultural awareness that's on this chart. You know that's a, associated with working with people, and. It, regard everyone almost always starts the conversation by saying we need to have people with great communication skills, right? Because we that that still is the crux of everything. And so these are all aspects that are again cultivated through a liberal arts education. And, and both we need to have both experiences within CIT, but then those experiences outside of CIT are critically important mm -hmm. to make sure we get all types of viewpoints. So people understand just, you know, going back a little bit to what I was saying before about getting multiple perspectives on, onto a problem. Um, so maybe we could go to the next slide here. You know, as, so, as kind of mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, as artificial intelligence begins to impact the workforce and autom automation replaces some of those cognitive skills that, that really were parts of the first three industrial revolution, there will be an increased need for other skills here. Like for example, the emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. the creativity and critical thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, future work will require creativity and intuition to solve these increasingly complex problems whose solutions require leaps of imagination. And you know, although there will always be this need for the, the testing and such, the 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 need the in, the emotional intelligence the social skills the creativity they will become increasingly important. Yeah. So I I will just chime in a little bit. I will say that uh, Chris has done a phenomenal job talking about some of those skills that are so important to um, the human experience. And you know, in a in a world where AI and robots will be able to carry out many of the tasks currently done by humans, you know, there are a special set of skills that will allow a certain set of people to thrive. And um, these skills by some are recognized as Renaissance skills. And by others, these are recognized as expert generalist skills. And, you know, Dean Pearson already made mention of them, but I will just illuminate them again, because I don't think we can ever talk enough about some of those humanistic skills that are extremely important in this fourth industrial revolution. You know, analytical skills, you know, the ability to be agile and work in settings that are multicultural and multidisciplinary. You know, high demand human skills that include curiosity and creativity, abstract thinking, critical thinking, logical reasoning, problem solving, and emotional intelligence. You know, that's a skill that we can't undervalue because the ability to engage with others um, and have emotional intelligence, um, that's extremely important. And so, um, I, I just wanted to amplify some of the things that was already mentioned by Dean Pearson, and I'll stop there. Yeah, yes, indeed. I mean, I think the points that you made, um, you know, Chris, with your T-shaped analogy, and Sandra, with your emphasis on, on, on sort of the 
the humanistic, deeply humanistic aspects of learning outcomes of these skills really remind me of, of general education, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we think about general education, many of these points um, actually are central to a general education program. So Nick, if you could click that, there you go, thanks. Um, so yeah, if you think about these 15, only three of them are very techni technical. The rest of them um, are throughout our, our, our base in our general education. And I think really the challenge to us is one of, you know, how do we communicate that? How do we strengthen that learning um, across, not just in the CIT, but across, across the university? But I'm afraid time is getting short here. And so I want to make sure that we have room for two additional questions or maybe some more. Um, and so I want to first talk about um, how, yeah, how can the technological foundations of the College of Innovation Technology be integrated with the liberal arts to ensure that that, that general education, those outcomes are in fact part of what um, all students, not just not just the future students of the CIT, but all students at the University of Michigan Flint uh, can benefit from. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Sanja, let's 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 sure. Yes, at, well, at the general level. <laughs> so, um, CAS, our College of Arts and Sciences, they offer many of the academic programs that are related to CIT, including math, computer science, and engineering but they also offer the less obvious degree programs that offer rich opportunities for the, some of those skills that we mentioned to be developed. So philosophy and sociology, anthropology, communication, English, there's more and more I can go on. We know that technology often relies on um, content like logic and understanding society in order to make advancements. So that is why it's imperative that these two colleges work hand in hand to create opportunities to better prepare our students. The other thing I'll say is that it is important that we help students to understand the importance of some of these skills and the ways in which they can take these skills to advance their, um, their job seeking and their uh, career aspirations and opportunities. And so we wanna make sure that students understand the critical importance of all of these skills. But one of the things that excites me the most is that we have two dynamic deans, you know, Dean Pearson and Dean Gano Phillips, who are fantastic collaborators and colleagues. They work regularly and often um, in terms of thinking about ways to advance the student experience. Uh, to help with um, all of the possibilities that exist and not only now, but in the future, making sure that our student needs and industry demands are what will um, make our 21st century work workforce the best. And these two deans are working in tandem and in partnership to make sure that students have the requisite skills needed. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank, thank you, Provost, for those for those kind words. And I also, you know, want to chime in here and say that I think it's really great that skills are the central point of the discussion here, because industry continues to move towards this skills over degrees model. You know, and this is just another one of the things that challenges us here in this in the in our in the way we've developed higher education. Um, you know, we put this in place, you know, more than a hundred years ago. Uh, but, you know, we need to move beyond this model. You know, we as an institution, which not only means, you know, CIT and CAS, right, are the two great partners, but everyone, all, the, all of the other units and, and actually everyone in this endeavor, we need to be able to be nimble and respond in ways that eliminate barriers for our learners. You know, whether this is in what we offer, our product, or, or how we offer it, the different ways that we can offer it. You know, and for example, right, so thinking about the skills uh, idea again. So for example, suppose, suppose all students have e-portfolios to share with their prospective employers. You know, during a job interview, they would be able to point to a particular skill. You know, suppose it's skill five there, creativity, originality, and initiative. You know, and show, and they would be able to have concrete examples and projects, not only from courses in their technical fields, 
but also from courses they complete in, you know, in history, philosophy, sociology, economics, whatever it is, most assuredly, you know, that, indi that individual will go on to the next level of their interview. It's important to understand that their portfolio is rich because it contains these many different viewpoints and concrete examples that they can point to. Thank you, Chris. I, I've always been interested, I've had a long history of being interested in the portfolios. And, and I think one thing about combining in a way creativity, because you have to be creative in how you put together your e-portfolio, right? And the more that you can sort of take ownership of that, that project, the more engaged you will be and the more excited you will be. And that'll show through in the interview as well, right? And that um, being excited about your learning and having that opportunity to reflect on your learning can be just so powerful. So yeah, thank you for bringing up that, that example. I really appreciate it. Um, before we close, I wanna make sure that we talk a little bit about entrepreneurialism. After all, this is liberal learning and entrepreneurialism. So we, can't, we need to make sure that we get that in there. Um, so what does entrepreneurialism mean to you, um, both in terms of how higher education and the CIT can be more entrepreneurial? In, 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 a, in a way, in a very important sense, it's almost as if we need to think about how does higher education or how can we make higher education meet the challenges that we see for our students? Or, the hopes and dreams we have for our students that we aspire for them to be able to achieve, how can we be self-reflective and think about that for our own uh, enterprise, what we do here in higher education? So Sanja, let's start with you and, and, and think about entrepreneurialism and higher education, and then Chris can talk about entrepreneurialism and, and the CIT. So thanks so much, Roy. You posed an excellent question. And what I will say is that for some, it's difficult for us to us in the academy to consider students as consumers or customers. However, students are engaging in consumer behavior as they look at their higher education options. You know, they consider such issues as price and convenience and the return on their investment. So that is what our students are. They are consumers or customers. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that we compromise on our curriculum or our commitment to academic excellence in a liberal arts educational experience. But what it does mean is that we must consider how we can deliver an optimal educational experience that will stand up in an increasingly competitive global market. So we can do that by looking at how we package our academics, whether it is through full degree programs in person, online, or even mixed modes. We have certificates that we offer. We're also anticipating changes in society and the workforce that demands us to be proactive rather than reactive as an academic institution. So at the end of the day, students do their best to feel that, an, to, they do their best to feel that an academic institution is not only based on how they interact with a faculty, the staff or, the stu or other students, but also they want those support services that help them to be successful. And, then, and that is where we must focus our attention. Mm -hmm. Stop there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, <clears throat> I will just, I, I mean, I would just follow that by, you know, by saying entrepreneurialism is, is creating value in original ways. You know, today we've kind of touched upon areas, you know, in higher ed anyway, that are kind of long overdue for creative solutions, this skills over degree model, uh, the necessity of lifelong learning and how to meet students where they are at in order to eliminate any barriers, you know, emerging technologies that we've talked about in the fourth industrial revolution and how this will influence not only the future workplace, but how, uh, how higher ed responds to that. You know, as, as CIT is being built through this clean sheet approach, 
um, you know, what really allows for novel and creative ideas, as kind of mentioned previously in the introduction, it allows for the reimagining of relationships with industry and government and the community. You know, in essence, it really is becoming an incubator for ideas, right? Um, and, and these novel creative ideas that are coming out has the ability to not only, we can leverage not only to provide innovative opportunities for our students, but we can also use that to cement UM Flint as an important piece of the regional economy by driving some regional economic growth. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Sanja. Thank you very much for this. This has been a great conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Um, Absolutely. If I can sum up sort of the arc of the conversation. So we've introduced changes that are ushering, ushered in by the fourth industrial revolution. And we've examined the skills our students need to be successful. And then I think in some ways, maybe even most importantly, we've reflected on our own practices and how we, how we as an institution of higher education can be more responsive in cultivating the important skills that they will need, being innovative with our pedagogies, right? And more flexible in, in how we deliver our curricula. So I think, you know, in some ways, the, the arc of the conversation stemmed from everything from the nuts and bolts to our own self-reflection. Um, and all of this, I think, is to say that if we are successful in this, in this project, if we are successful in reimagining um, higher education in the light of the fourth industrial revolution, I think we can be confident that we'll continue to be able to make sure that our students remain leaders and best. And so I think that is, um, I think that's so important. So I've seen that we've got some questions coming in already um, and, and we've still got a good half hour here, uh, but I am going to take advantage of my role as the moderator here and, and insert a question because I um, actually yesterday I attended a, a webinar on creativity and STEM and it was just fascinating, really interesting. And so I guess I just wanna focus a little bit more on creativity because in a way creativity is about problem solving. Mm -hmm. when, I tell, when I tell students, incoming students at orientation about the gen ed program and, and the, that one of the learning outcomes has to be about creative thinking. I say, you know, creative thinking is not something that is you know, just takes place in your sculpture class or your painting class or your music class. But if you're going to be innovative, if you're going to make an impact, if you're going to really push an industry or a business or a, even a discipline forward, you're going to have to be creative in your thinking, right? Um, that's the only way that we make real major steps, leaps forward in terms of our understanding is through creativity, creative thinking. So how do you think we can make, how, how do you think we can help infuse more creativity across all the disciplines and, you know, in the, in the, in the, curricula that's, that's emerging in, in CIT. So um, whoever wants to go first, go for sure. it. Sure, yeah, right, I, I can respond. Thank you, Roy. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, we've hit that, you know, pretty solidly today that, that creativity is important and, and it's needed for the increasingly complex problems. We don't want to do just what works, but we want to develop this um, this environment where we can, you know, we can try the novel or maybe the risky solutions to, to have that, to encourage that creativity. So again, you know, I, I think for this endeavor to be successful, which it will be, it will be a successful endeavor. It, it's, it, it needs to encompass all, right? It, so it's, you know, within CIT, we have to, within CIT, really encourage the creativity but we also, when our students take classes across the institution, we also need to have, you know, we need to inspire the creativity in, in all those areas, right? Um, and, you know, just kind of, you know, drilling really down into, into CIT for a moment, there's this, how, how technologies can really kind of impact the creative process, for example, right? Um, for example, in, in manufacturing, right? We're gonna drill really down here for a moment. In manufacturing for, for tens of thousands of years, humans have used subtractive manufacturing technologies. That means taking something, removing pieces to end up with the product that you want, right? So the very first stone tools were made by subtractive mm -hmm. techniques. They chipped away the stone until they were left with something they wanted. 
Now, right with the, with the new technology of 3D printing, which we now have available in all kinds of fascinating materials like carbon fiber and metals and everything, it really allows for the reimagining, a complete creativity. We don't have to think anymore about, I have to make this product by taking material away. I can make this product by just adding material and that just <laughs> completely opens up uh, the creativity spectrum. I mean, and that's, you know, I, I realize it's really a drill down example, but I, you know, it just is, it, it is indicative of how some of these fourth industrial revolution technologies are really challenging us to think differently. Yeah, and what I will add is that I, I appreciate that analogy, Dean Pearson. I, I love the ways in which uh, creativity has evolved over time. You know, and I think about all of our disciplines, I think about all of our colleges and the ways in which we can foster and promote creativity. And I think sometimes it requires us to deviate from our, you know, our ways of teaching and ways of getting students to provide assignments to convey their knowledge base, giving students the ability to think broadly, to make mistakes, to make corrections, you know, helping them to do things in iterative fashion and also engaging with each other and having these conversations such that their thinking is broadened from other perspectives. So what I think is important is that in the academy here at UM Flint, we have to give students every opportunity for creative thinking because not every student is raised in a home or in a community where they are fostered to think creatively, broadly, just let the mind wander. And I, I think it's helpful if in, in the academy, specifically at UM Flint, we, where we can give students the freedom, the freedom to be creative thinkers, give them the tools to be creative thinkers, and then watch them do what they do, which I'm sure will be beyond anything we can expect by giving them permission to do that such that it's not just focused on, oh, I gotta get, I have to study for this test, I gotta get this. And I get the importance of proficiency and assessing proficiency and mastery through tests. But I also recognize that there are ways in which we can assess proficiency and mastery through creative ways. So I, I would love for us to do more of that. Yeah, I thinking about both creativity and, and additive, manufacturing um, in the conversation with the chancellor, he mentioned that one of the tipping points in terms of the fourth industrial revolution is going to be uh, the first 3D printed liver. And so you're, you're combining you know, biological uh, knowledge and, and, and expertise with manufacturing and to think that so out of the box to again, additive uh, technologies is just, just mind blowing. I mean, obviously, I can I can think and talk about this all afternoon. But uh, Nick, what are some of the questions that are uh, that have come up, and um, and you can direct them to 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 our panelists? Yes, of course, and just great engaging conversation so far. And I think this next question kind of gets at the heart of some of this as well. Um, so the first question we have here is regarding uh, concerns around AI not addressing issues of diversity and equity, and in fact, exacerbating those problems at times. So how can we, um, representing U of M Flint, use our strengths and focus areas of diversity, equity, inclusion, critical thinking um, to integrate that into this AI and our future development? Yeah. Well, what, what I will add is I, I sincerely appreciate that question because one of the things that is evident in the literature is that you know, the fourth industrial revolution will create far more inequities than we have ever seen from other industrial revolutions. And so I think it goes back to what I heard Dean Pearson talk about when he said that we will have to create policies that ensure that not only the people around the table are people that are the creators of these technologies are being considered but they're also thinking about the people that are not at the table. Um, we have to be, we have to think about ways of ensuring that 
students understand the importance of technology irrespective of their major. So whether you're an English major, um, a nursing major, pre-med major, or someone majoring in digital manufacturing, we're always thinking about the, the implications associated with technology. We, we can't negate the fact that technology is a part of our society and will continue to be. But as we're using technology, we have to think about how do we disseminate and make sure that other communities and cultures are able to have access to these resources? And how do we take the technology to where people are? I think that's one of the ways in which we can impact our diverse communities. And so Dean Pierce, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think the point about multidisciplinarity is just so crucial. And I mean, certainly being cognizant of that need and cognizant of the, the negative impacts and the inequalities is a good start. But we've got to make sure, as you say, that everybody's at the table, uh, the philosophers, right? The uh, people in the social sciences that are thinking about these new technologies as they're emerging. Because if we don't, we're going to miss out. We're going to miss important, important negative effects. <laughs> and, and we've got to make sure that those conversations are supported and um, are at the forefront of our, of our decision making. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and I would you know reiterate the example of 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 of, it, of the necessity of there being a, the two way conversation, right? We we need the we we need the people that are setting the policy to at least understand at some level the technology, but we also need the people creating the technology to understand what are the implications of the creation, right? But but it's. That's why it's great that we can we can be here in this institution where where we have all these wonderful colleagues to to converse with rather than just in just for example in a strictly school of technology right where we wouldn't have the ability to have these rich conversations with other colleagues in in in, in the various disciplines but those are the conversations that need to be in my opinion need to be fostered and and uh, you know shepherded along so we can so we can develop these areas that allow both of those thoughts, you know, both uh, directions on the, on the road. May, and I, I would just like to add, as we bring things up to our current moment, I think one of the things of the, that uh, the COVID pandemic has illuminated is some of our inequities and disparities. Mm -hmm. So whether it's our college students or whether it's our, you know, K through 12 students that were forced to, um, you know, learn remotely and realizing the communities and the cultures and, you know, some people had access to technology while others didn't. And how that will even deepen the divide associated with tech, you know, with learning and, and advancements and so the thing about the COVID pandemic is that it has illuminated some of the ways in which there are disadvantages in certain communities and, and how a segment of our society or segments of our society can be left behind as a result of some of these inadequacies or, or um, inequities. And so my hope is that, you know, with, with the evolution of the fourth industrial revolution that, that we can be more cognizant of who's left out of the narrative and who doesn't have access to the resources. So if it's all right, I'll just jump to uh, I think other relevant question here and then we'll go back to the others we have. So this is from Dean Dano Phillips. Despite the ubiquitous impacts of the fourth industrial revolution and technologies on students, faculty, and everyone's daily lives, it seems that many individuals are challenged in thinking about their current or future work as being impacted by technological innovation. Some don't seem to connect the need to be technologically savvy or skill and skilled with their everyday use of these technologies. Do either of you have thoughts about how to engage more 
of our campus and community to move from being consumers of technology to being skilled members of the technology enhanced workforce, i.e. they don't have to major in DMT or ITI, but they will need to be more technologically savvy. Wow. Well, I will just say this before I pass it on to my colleague. To, that was a phenomenal question, Dean Gano Phillips. I have to process some a good response or an even adequate response, but perhaps my colleague Dean Pearson might have a an answer. That's a very good question. No, that is a fantastic question, and I think you know that it, it's one of the it's one of the main challenges, right? In in order for this um, for the conversation to move forward. We we it we need to understand and and all of, and you know and like pull on the same oar if you will that that technology uh, conversant being being con technology conversant is going to be ne necessity right so autonomous vehicles autonomous vehicles in the future no machine machines aren't perfect because inherently they're programmed by people so mm -hmm. autonomous vehicles. Are going to have accidents that rely that are going to result in in tragedies. So where where does the responsibility lie? So the the people that you know are not developing the algorithms, but the people that are working on the policy or or the lawyers or or the society that needs to deal with that will have to at least understand what it what does it mean to have an autonomous vehicle. So I, I think that. The, the way to cultivate those experiences is just to provide as many examples from, from, the, from a person's own lens where they can see that this is happening within their, you know, within their lens, and then maybe try to guide those discussions together, right? So getting people from their own lens to looking at the lens of being rather just a consumer to being involved, right? To, to being at least conversant and, and knowledgeable about technology. So, yeah, but, but I, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. And right, and if, and if we can crack that one, we will be the leader of, of higher ed actually. Yes, absolutely. And what I would like to add <clears throat> to the conversation is, you know, it, it made me think about a conversation I had in a meeting earlier today where we as a campus community, we are evolving with our technology and realizing that even as we have the technological resources that will bring us up to date into the 21st century, there are persons that have been doing things a certain way, the longhand way. And there are those that might be resistant to doing it in ways that are more expedient, more that are ways that are efficient and effective, which frees us up to do some other things better. And so we can give persons the opportunity to get up to speed and to learn how to, how to allow technology to be our friend and to do our jobs and to do it better. But we also have to realize that when there are persons that don't want to, there's a challenge when there are persons that don't want to use the benefits of technology, even when it's at our fingertips. And we have to make decisions about, so what do we do about that? Because we can spend a lot of human hours doing certain kinds of tasks that if we use the technology we have, it can be done in an hour, whereas it could take days to do it in manual ways. So we have to celebrate and recognize the benefits of technology, which really probably would free us up to do some of the, the relational things that we need to do in order to ensure the greater good of our students, the benefit of our students. I think this next question is a really nice one to tie into that as well. Um, when technology matures in an area, we need people skilled in the application of technology rather than just the development of technology, including policy and broader Im impacts of that specific technology. As a computer scientist, I am thinking of the difference between application of technology versus the development of technology. 
and whether advanced topics such as robotics and AI have crossed the development versus application line. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, so I'll, I'll just comment on that. I'm not sure if that is is a it, how how to if that is a question or or just a kind of a comment, which I think is a is a very insightful comment, by the way. But the, I mean, this is it. I, I think he's uh, the the person is, the comment is getting to the crux of when those things become emergent, right, in, into society, when they become um, that that's kind of it, it seems like that's kind of the switch that turns it on to being something that uh, people need to be that society then needs to be uh, technologically conversant with rather than just the development, right? So. So there's technologies that are currently being developed, right? So, so my background is a you know experimental solid state physicist. So some of the things that I worked on 20 to 25 years ago are now just starting to get into development, right? So when they become from development to application, that's when, um, as the comment says, you know that's when it flips the switch to being um, saying you know we need to be um, understanding what that technology is. Well, one, one thing, too, that I sort of come across in thinking about the, the, the technological change has been a greater emphasis on user experience and, um, and how, and so maybe in that change from development to application, and then this notion of uh, a broad-based discussion among people from various perspectives, disciplinary perspectives, is to make sure that that user experience um, is always always part of the conversation as well. I'm not, you know, not just the negative effects, but then also the user experiences in terms of the application. Um, so I think that might be an important uh, inroad to that, into that, uh, maybe from a different perspective, inroad to that conversation. Um, I think we've touched on this quite a bit, but you know, perhaps if there's anything additional to say. The question is, could Dean Pearson speak about how the CIT curriculum plans to ensure that it incorporates all of these necessary skills into its course offerings. Right, so, so that, that is the, the curriculum development that will be, uh, you know, that's uh, gonna be a key part of the curriculum development within CIT. Um, and it's not only, again, it's, you know, just hearkening back and, and hitting on these points again, it's not only in the courses that students take in CIT, but it's in, it's in all those courses, giving them that rich breadth of experiences across all disciplines, right? So, so you know, by I, I think by understanding the importance of this, you know, we you know it we will convey that to our students. We will say, hey, you want to we want to progress in CIT and 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 understand what we're what we're hoping to accomplish. We we recognize these as very important developmental pieces. So, so we will, of course, uh, uh, include them in our curriculum uh, throughout our programs, right? Because we want our, we, we want, not only we want, we need our students to be successful. We want them to be successful so, so that they, so they recognize that UM Flint was transformative in their lives. And that, you know, that helps us all actually. If I could parse it, one more question um, here regarding privacy concerns. I know one of the bigger things we were looking at in the future jobs is that I think it was 85% is really looking at big data and kind of different ways that we understand that landscape. Um, can you speak to, you know, if there's any concern there or if we see this more as an opportunity as we move forward to better understand our consumer landscape? So, I mean, I, I will jump in here again and, you know, and I'm, and I don't mean to sound like a, a broken record here, but again, it's going it, to, we're, we're going to need the people that work on the algorithms of the big data. And then we're also going to need the people that set the policies for understanding what that is so that they can understand what it means for, for data to be secure. What are the implications when data is not secure? What happens, right? Who's responsible? all those things. So we need to have those rich conversations for, for that, for, for that, for, you know, for that example and, and all the others that we've kind of addressed. And if, if I could actually go back to the prior question about um, the skills needed in the fourth industrial revolution and uh, the curriculum in the CIT, I, I guess I would just like to emphasize that the College of Arts and Sciences courses, um, you know, 
or courses across the university can integrate aspects of um, those skills into their into their courses. So as an example, I mean, I was thinking about my, my statistic class and, you know, is there a way that you could not just teach or uh, the, you know, the, the basic understanding of inferential statistics, but also along the way, maybe say, hey, you know, here's some, here's some things you can do in an Excel spreadsheet. And that knowledge of using Excel can take you not just from, you know, crunching numbers in first a statistics course, but it could also be applied to other applications. And you could can be conversant in that type of technology, you know, at a very, very user perspective, but it's still something that you could, you could point to if you needed to in, in a job interview. One comment here, and I think it speaks really well to that foundational element, you know, between the College of Arts and Sciences and the upcoming College of Innovation Technology is from uh, Dr. Witt, who says, a course akin to a great books course would be useful to introducing students to this arena call it great inventors. Absolutely agree. And, and uh, you know, I know there's a, I know there's an effort going forward to, to submit a, a Teagle Foundation grant that is, you know, that encompasses this idea of great books and the theme throughout uh, a general education experience. So, and these are, you know, when, when that product is ready, this is something that CIT is ready, is ready to embrace. Okay, well, I think that's it for um, submitted questions. But again, just a wonderful discussion. Really appreciate you taking the time and everyone's great input. Um, this is what makes it exciting for us here. I mean, this is exactly what we're hoping to achieve moving forward is coming together and finding these intersections that really touch on everyone's lives. Yes, thank you very much, Nick, for, for supporting us and, and you know making sure everything runs smoothly. And, and I certainly want to express my sincere gratitude to the Provost Sanja Fees Price and uh, my, my dear colleague and former Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, mm -hmm. Dean Christopher Pearson. Um, it's, it's, been a, it's been an honor, but it's also been an immense pleasure. I, I, I just think these conversations are so interesting and so important. Um, so, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to, to, to think through some of these, these topics. Well, Roy, I, I want to say thank you for the invitation. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the liberal learning entrepreneurialism um, lecture series. And I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to talk about the fourth industrial revolution and how it impacts our campus community. And also being a part of this conversation with my distinguished Dean uh, Chris Pearson. So it's been an honor and a pleasure. And I will just say thank you to Nick for being an outstanding resource to us. And for those of you that are still here with us, thank you for staying and, um, and, and being a part of this experience to the, until the end. Yeah. And, and I, again, I, yeah, I just follow up and say, I, I too am thankful for, for the invitation and for all those uh, people that attended and the great conversation that we had here following our uh, discussion, you know, and um, I, I do, I do want to reiterate, and I mentioned this last night at the at the alumni event. You know, standing up a new academic unit, it it takes a village, right? I know right. We're, we're we're all we're gonna all. I, I know that I'm the dean. I understand that, but we're all gonna have to chip in mm -hmm. for this to be a successful endeavor. So, and I appreciate everyone's uh, willingness to do so. Truly, it's been a it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, and one. Last plug, um, in April, we're going to have Dean Gano Phillips uh, talk about the fourth industrial revolution and what it means for more specifically on what it means for our students. So stay tuned. Um, thank you all for your time and for uh, being part of this conversation. And um, we'll see you in April. Yes, thank you.